Just tell me how bad your addiction got. Oh, how bad did it get? Um, it was such, it was such a long addiction and an enduring addiction. And I tried to cope. I tried to tell myself lies to keep myself, keep my addiction alive. To be quite honest, but over time it just got so bad. I was using multiple drugs because. The drugs were taking the pain away, the emotional and psychological pain and the trauma I experienced, but they weren't working anymore. So I was combining drugs, upping the ante, taking more drugs, and it was literally just destroyed my body and my mind until it nearly killed me. Okay, so were, were you able to hold down a job? I helped. Tell us your daily life routine. Yeah, God, my daily life routine. It was like Groundhog Day. So you'd start with a hangover from the previous day? I wouldn't even call it a hangover. So I would wake up probably after about a couple of hours sleep because I could never sleep. So if I got a couple of hours sleep, I'd wake up an hour late to go into work. And that was a challenge. I'd wake up, I'd probably take, and this be in the depths of addiction, I would have taken probably five or six sleeping tablets just so I could operate that day. Like I'd take them in the morning. I take so uh, as you were getting up, you take sleep in towers. Yeah, my biology. What were was, these benzos? What were you taking? Benzos are zopiclone, whatever I could get my hands on, basically. Yeah, really crazy. And would you, were you able to afford to buy these? Yeah, yeah, you could buy them. You, you could get them on the internet today on the dark web. But at the time, they were very um, av highly available. Euro. Like pop. you weren't robbing them. No, no, okay. I was buying them. I was. And buying you had them. a good job, did you? I had a good job. I ironically worked in a packaging industry for Big Pharma, designing methadone and anti-anxiety medication, among many other things. And I, I, it was a very loving environment. It was a very friendly environment, a family environment. So I was nearly enabled within the workplace as well because they were trying to look out for me. So that was a, that was a key part of me holding down the job as well. And So it's 10 o'clock, you're in work. How, what's your next move? The next move was a couple. I'd do my methadone after the tablets. I'd get to work. I didn't have an addiction problem. It was the symptom of... Uh, the addiction was really the drugs were just a symptom of an underlying problem which was anxiety and panic attacks so I'd need to take the edge off that so I'd do a couple of lines of heroin sometimes I'd go in and do a couple of lines in the bathroom just to take the edge off to get through work then I'd leave work I'd get home and drive myself into oblivion bottle of vodka more tablets more heroin comatose for the night probably wake up and would you not be as high as a kite in the afternoon in the office? No, I, I was more sick than... So one thing that I think is a bit mis misunderstood with, with people with drug addiction, when they see them sort of like a little bit comatose and, and, and really struggling, they think they're stoned and high. Usually that's sickness. They're just very unwell. So I would just be managing, just trying to get through the day. Okay, so you're 35, you have a seizure. What happened? So I call that moment the most painful but also the most important night in my life. And I woke up on me sitting around the floor. I'd gone through, I started to do a detox. I was trying to get clean, but I couldn't get into a benzo detox. So I'd done a benzo detox at home on my own. And I had a grand mal convulsive seizure, which what, what happened? Was it a heart attack, a stroke? What was no, it? No, so a grand mal convulsive seizure, it was from the benzos, coming off the benzos too quickly. So every neuron in my brain basically would have firing at the same time, like a cascading effect. So I was pulsing, twisting, convulsing on the floor. I drove my teeth up into my tongue. Horrific scenes. My brother thought I was dead. But long story short, I got to the hospital later that night and I had an experience where I couldn't cogn cognitively make out what was my reality. I couldn't label my environment and I thought it was brain damaged. I remember thinking, oh my God, that's brain damage. Game over. You're done. And I was waiting for the anxiety and panic to just consume me. But I had a moment of, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't fight this anymore. I give up. I'm done. And as I lay back down on the trolley waiting to be overwhelmed, I felt a sense of peace. Something I had never felt in my entire life. And what I've retrospectively realised that that was a moment of surrender, a moment of letting go. I was always trying to fight my own mind, fight anxiety, resist reality. But I put up the white flag. And after that, I truly believe that that's the moment that completely transformed my perspective. And the journey you then went on was that you found out, I presume to psychotherapy, <clears throat> that in your childhood you had had a, a really life-altering experience that was bottled down inside you. And this yeah. usually comes out of therapy. What, what was that about? 
Yeah, it was through therapy, self-reflection, and I wrote my book. When I was writing my book, I'd done a lot of research around that as well. And I basically had a condition known as intestinal malrotation as an infant. I was only a few weeks old. So I had to have a big operation to fix that, to, to fix me, me intestines. And prior to 1985, what I learned was that the medical practice did not give infants a general anaesthetic. So I would have gone under the knife when they inserted the scalpel. I didn't have a general anaesthetic. I wasn't asleep. I recently found... So you had stomach surgery without an anaesthetic? Without, without a general anaesthetic. So they would have given me a low... I, I spoke to a surgeon recently that done these surgeries and he says there would have been a local anaesthetic and they would have actually quite likely put me on a, a crucifix type of apparatus and giving me alcohol to pacify me in the moment. So it's it's up in the air of exactly what would have been done. So you believe, yeah. and was that just a once-off event? That was a once-off event. And what the medical practice believed, that babies don't remember that, and they didn't experience that pain. But we know today that a traumatic experience, like there's a great book out there, The Body Keeps the Score. And biologically, what trauma does, it changes our biology, priming us, making us hyper vigilant for future threats. It's an, it's an adaptive system. It's an adaptive process. Okay. So it lets me as a finely tuned anxiety machine. That's how I see it. So, Brian Penny, you're now Dr. Brian Penny. You went back to Trinity. You went to Trinity. You've become a neuroscientist. Tell us how you reconstructed your life. That sh the shift in perspective was key and I don't know what exactly happened. There was a moment of awareness that I just started to see what I was doing to myself. But I really needed to work on my anxiety. I realised that the drugs were not the problem. It was something under the bonnet, a root cause. So I went to treatment. I went to work on myself. I created a programme to navigate my own life, to manage my own emotional world. But I went back to college as well. I'd done a degree in psychology and I wanted to know why was I so broken and mentally and emotionally? But why did I, why, through the shift in perspective, why did I now feel so energised and curious and happy? There was a, a happiness. I was nearly happy in a heroin detox, my second detox, which was bizarre. And I wanted to share that with other people. So I went on to learn through academia and through books and develop a program that I could go and help other people with similar struggles. And today, you, you've written a memoir. Tell us about that and tell us, <clears throat> you know, what, what, what programs you're lecturing and, and yeah. talking to and client base and so on. Yeah, so the the, the book I, it was called Bonus Time. The reason why I call it Bonus Time, I believe I was given a second chance at life. So I'm living on bonus time. And my bonus time, like I've created a business called Change is Possible. I've, I'm very lucky and grateful to go around the world and Ireland to deliver programs in the corporate arena. But I also, I call it the Robin Hood business model. I, I, I use what my earnings then to deliver work in for more, in more disadvantaged areas. So I, I deliver retreats up in Oberstown, the children's detention campus. I've done a couple of mentorship programs. So you've committed your adult life to this, really? Yeah, 100%. Yes. 100%. And helping young young kids as well that have struggled with traumas as well that could be susceptible. So what's your message to people who are using at the moment? Because they say it's as easy to get drugs as a pizza in this country. Yeah, God, it's 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 to to say what the message. Um, what what I would say for many people is, like, is addiction a choice? No, it, addiction is not a choice. It's really not a choice. The, the best the best way I can describe it is for some people, may think oh, it's a choice. You use drugs or you don't use drugs. But kids can be like curious. people say that about drink and so yeah. smoking and watching your weight and all that. It is sort of self responsibility, self control. What do you say to that? So imagine imagine that you had an itch. And you wanted to scratch that itch. But imagine you lived in an area or you struggled with a certain amount of pain. Let's say you had um, trauma in your life. Let's say there was physical abuse in your life. Let's say there was poverty in your life. Well, that itch will just get itchier and itchier and itchier. And you eventually you might scratch that itch. And a behavioral principle is that behavior that's rewarded is repeated. So if you are rewarded by a drug that takes away that pain, you are going to do it again. So maybe as a 13 or 14 year old kid drinking for the first time, you could call that a choice. But if drugs and alcohol is around you and the people around you are doing that as well, you're going to do it at some stage. And if that's massively rewarded, you will do it again. And if you get sort of dragged into that and you try it a few times, like it gave me a sort of, it was like a blanket. First, my first time doing heroin, it was like a, a soft, warm blanket that just wrapped around me. And I wanted that again. And over time of just playing with that, it hijacked my brain. That's what happens with addictions. You might like it, then you want it. Then it becomes a pathological craving where you just need that. And it's not a choice. Like if you have had certain life circumstances, you are going to drive, there's going to be a drive 
strive to escape and avoid that emotional and so psychological pain. So the vice pain. grip nature of the yeah. addiction means it's not a choice. It's not a choice. If you're suffering from addiction, uh, do uh, remember the HSC Drugs and Alcohol Confidential Helpline. It's free phone, 1800. Very simple number, 1800 459 459. And there are so many other lines. We wish you well with the book called again. Bonus time. Thank you, Evan. Dr. Brian Penny, uh, a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm sure you will be an inspiration to many people who are suffering from drug addiction.